we live, we live in a reality that is shaped not entirely by, but very much by words and how we use them. Words matter to a great degree, greater than we sometimes realize. The example I like to give for that from the pulpit is, words matter so much that I could say some things right now that would make it so I never get to stand up here again. Just a, just a few well-placed words and phrases and thoughts and suddenly my whole life would change. Words have that kind of power. Uh, words, words matter so much that when we look at the beginning of Scripture and see in Genesis the way the world is formed is God speaks the world into existence. He says, let there be light and there's light. Word has that kind of power. It's not just the Old Testament. Switch it to the New Testament and the Gospel of John as John tries to help us understand who Jesus is and how Jesus came to be and what Jesus does. He starts off by saying Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Words really matter, and, and we live in a time, and maybe this has always been the case, but I suspect because of the availability of communication now, we li live in a time where words are just thrown out as though they're meaningless. The, and you've been around people sometimes who use very few words, and the ones they do mean more and then you've been around people, uh, preachers like me, who just are always talking and it just doesn't, you know, the words start to lose their power as they just get drained and strung out. And one of the things about the power of words to create our experience of reality and even realities themselves is that if they match with what is real, the words have greater ability to bring fruitfulness and life into the world around us. If our words don't match with the reality that God created, then those words will cause us to fail, will cause darkness and evil to be a part of our existence. Um, that's, that's where we're going today. I'm going to back up just a little bit because that's just sort of uh, up here kind of stuff. So I'll start with a story about my sister. One of my sisters, I have With stuff, you just were told to push through. That's that's just how it goes back then. So my my sister didn't do as well as some of the others of us. She had to work super hard for what she got. She didn't do terrible, but she just didn't do quite as she wasn't quite as natural at school as some of her siblings were. And when it came time to go to college, she wanted to get into a, a program that was pretty exclusive, and it, she knew her grades probably were just not good enough, but she applied anyway. And uh, when she got word back from them, they said, uh, we want an interview with you. We, they, it was exclusive enough of a program that you had to be interviewed. So she was already knew she was on the edge and she was nervous about the interview. And uh, when she told my dad what had to happen and that she had to make the hour and a half trip to the college to, to get the interview, my dad said, oh, you're, you're a Weimer. Weimers do great at interviews. That'll be fine. And so she thought, well, I guess I'll do well at interviews. And she went and went through the interview and came home unsure of what happened. One of the things the professor said to her was, we wish your grades were better. And she said, yeah, I, I do too. <laughs> you know, that, uh, that's, um, just before she graduated from that program, one of those professors pulled her aside and said, I'm so glad you are graduating. When we let you in, every year we let one person in who we think doesn't have the grades. But you nailed the interview and we let you in. Oh. Now, did my dad create that reality? Did he just match that reality? What was at work when he just offhand tells my sister, oh, you're a Weimer, you, Weimers do great at interviews. And by the way, my sister tells me when she told my dad she got in, he looked surprised. <laughs> um, words are strange things. 
They helped construct realities sometimes. Sometimes they just help reveal realities. And sometimes they shield realities from us. So as we try to think through the Christian life, the words we're going to have to think through are going to matter a lot because we don't always know which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that's good to remember about words and uh, their power is if they, if they get disconnected from the story that gave them birth, then sometimes you don't even realize what they are saying beyond what's on the face of them. And so we as listeners and speakers of language say things we don't even know we're saying. I made a list of, of things that we say today that are from the King James Version of the Bible. There's so many phrases that we don't even realize we're quoting the, the King James when we say things like, there's nothing new under the sun, wash your hands of the matter, the handwriting is on the wall, you're at wit's end, a wolf in sheep's clothing, see eye to eye, in the twinkling of an eye, don't put words in my mouth, the powers that be, that phrase comes from the King James Version, how the mighty have fallen. Forbidden fruit, that whole concept is from scripture, but from the King James translation of it. Go the extra mile, fly in the ointment, a leopard can't change his spots. That's just a small sample of the things we say that are actually referring back to scripture that we don't even always realize we're doing. No. We have access to these deep reserves of reality in our language, and when they get disconnected from our story, we don't even realize what we have in our midst. And language is that way because it begins to train us to think in certain ways and to act in certain ways, and we're not even, we don't even realize that we're being trained. Uh, there was a professor from University of California, San Diego, who about uh, 2014 did, a, did an experiment. Uh, Laura, Lara Boroditsky, I think was her name. She asked a room full of, Ameri of American professors to close their eyes, and she told them to point southeast. And when she did that, she said, they pointed in every possible direction in that room. She did the same thing with six-year-old Aboriginal girls in Australia asked them to close their eyes and point southeast, and every single one of them pointed southeast. Because, she said, in their language, they don't say the person to your left or to your right. They say the person to your south, the person to your east. They use directionals in everyday language in a way that allows them to be more aware of where they are in the, in the compass, so to speak, than they would be otherwise. Language makes some things more possible and other things less possible. And it's all languages. You're not going to find, we're not going to find one language that does it all. Another thing that has struck me about language, and this comes from way back when I was a minister in Florida, there was an older lady named Pat Hirschberger, I believe was her name. She grew up in Germany, and she told me once, and I've never followed up on this, I need to, some, maybe one of you knows about this, and you can come find me afterward, because I'd love to hear more about it. She said she grew up reading the Prussian Bible. That was the language that she knew scripture. Um, and she told me that when she became an English speaker and began re reading the English Bible, what struck her was how much more violent the Prussian Bible was than the English Bible. Just the language difference impacted the message she was receiving from Scripture. As we continue this series on discipleship, we talked last week about a serving big with someone and how even the greatest disciples that we find in scripture had to deal with being a part of a mission too big for their own lives and how they all wound up feeling empty and broken at times and how they had to invite other people into their, that pain because that mission was bigger than them. And as we add on to it this week, I want us to pay attention to the worlds into which we invite people by the languages and words and understandings of reality that we have. Uh, we, we want to turn, I believe, to that which best reveals the God who created reality. 
We want to match up with the reality of the universe as much as possible. And what we believe as Christians is that the best, most full revelation of who that God is comes to us in Jesus of Nazareth, the Word made flesh. If we want to understand who God is, and if we want to understand what God put into the fabric of the universe, we look at who Jesus Christ is, and we try to emulate that. We try to bring the, the, the world of Christ into our own world. Now, the best way to know who Jesus is, is through the life of the church and then also through Scripture. And we believe Scripture is a sure and reliable guide to who Jesus is, what Jesus taught, and to the mission Jesus was a part of as he walked the earth. And so I want to commend Scripture to you as a discipleship process this morning. But more than just scripture for reading and, and uh, memorization, those things are really good to do. Uh, we have been uh, recommending people do the Read Scripture app this year uh, because we want all of us as much as possible to be feeding at, from the same table, to be drinking from the same well, so that as we form together as a body, we have a shared understanding of what God once done and how God wants it done and who God is. So I commend scripture reading to you, but not just so that you can memorize a, a bunch of words. I want you to read scripture with an eye toward what scripture is saying about reality. Because it is out of that reality that we speak and that we live. It is out of that reality that we decide how we're going to treat our neighbor, our family, our friends, and our enemies. It's out of that reality that we decide how we want to spend our time and what's important to us in this life. So as we read scripture together, what we're called to do is envision something, that access to something deeper and real that will animate the whole life of the church together as we try to be the kingdom of God here on earth. That's what I want us to read, reading scripture. Uh, that's the goal of reading scripture. When I was a, an, a kid, we had a teacher who would let us uh, mark how many chapters we'd read that week on the board, and that was to get us to read. But of course, uh, we abused the system because, you know, you could read Psalm 117 a whole bunch right before she walks into the room. And so we were just reading in order to get it under our belts. Uh, the reality is we are reading in order to see the nature of God and our own reality. That's what we're called to try and work out and do in our lives together. Because wherever we find our understanding of reality, that's the, that's the place out of which we will speak and live. And there are so many options for us. You can find the, your understanding of reality in the Twitterverse. If that's, if that's where you decide what is going to motivate and lead you and help you understand why we're here and what we're doing and how we're supposed to do it, then you will wind up living and speaking in a very different way and for very different reasons. If you decide you want to watch the 24-hour news cycle over and over again, um, you're going to wind up living in a certain way and speaking out of that experience and what you'll find in both of those, I think, is you'll wind up nervous and afraid all the time. Because it's all about to fall apart every second. I am surprised that we can sit here in such peace and quiet and comfort. Because the world is always about to end, is how it feels. If you take your understanding of what is important in reality out of something like nationalism or tribalism or my people or my family, you will wind up behaving one way versus another. You'll wind up deciding who your enemy is based on who, who impacts your family negatively, who impacts your city, your nation, whatever. That will become the enemy. And you will wind up thinking and speaking in that way. If your reality becomes just making sure you have enough to be comfortable and, and to consume whatever you need to consume, then you will begin to look at people who compete for those, 
resources as the enemy. Every reality that we begin to experience, that we buy into, winds up having all sorts of different consequences. And the reason I say that if those don't match with reality, they will lead to a bad place is because it becomes, it becomes a situation where you want to fight off the wrong people. We are called into a different narrative. We are called into a different understanding of how the world works. We are called into a world where God is king. And God has accomplished what God seeks to accomplish and will continue to do so through you. And part of that process is to value every human life, including your enemy, and to love and to serve and to care for, and it creates a different world. It creates different families. It creates different friendships. It creates different communities when we follow through with the things God has called us to do. So we we are called to study this mission that is revealed in Scripture together as a people because if it's just you or just you or just you, it's not going to have that much power. But when we all understand that God created all that is seen and unseen and loves every person made in his image, it begins to change our mission in life. It also changes, by the way, how you feel about yourself. Because we all have times where we wind up thinking that we're We're um, worth loathing, and that's about it. But when you really deeply understand that you're created by God, it changes even how you relate to yourself. It's a life-changing reality that comes to us once we understand the narrative of what God is doing in Scripture and history and with words and language. And so it matters how we speak to each other. And the way that we speak the right way and the right things to each other is to understand out of what we speak. And we speak out of a narrative where God created everything. And even though we are part of the fall of humanity, even though we are broken, even though we are in need, God loves us. And while we are yet sinners, sends Christ to die for us, even though we were enemies of God and God calls us into eternal relationship and eternal life with the very one who created all that is. That story, that reality, it's untouchable. Not even death. Not even death can overcome that story. Good luck finding another one that powerful. The word of God reveals a world that is beautiful and broad and fantastic. Now, by this point in the sermon, I've usually at least turned to the scripture I used for the sermon. I wanted to hold it till later because we're doing it a little bit differently today. Uh, The first text you heard was, Uh, One that I I don't remember the first time I heard this text. I grew up in the church hearing Jesus cry on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I remember hearing that as a kid and reading these texts as a kid, um, thinking it's just little more than Christ on the cross feeling abandoned. That's what we focus on with this. Why have you forsaken? Why am I all alone? And not that I noticed it back then, but just looking at it again this, this week in Matthew chapter 27, uh, verse 45, which you heard Joe read this morning, and Joe, great job with the Eli, Eli, Lama, Sakbatani. Um, that is Aramaic, and the reason it's translated in the Gospel of Matthew is the first readers of Matthew didn't know Aramaic, uh, and I think the other reason it's, they put the original Aramaic in there is because that Eli, Eli part uh, explains why the people at the foot of the cross went, oh, he's calling Elijah. 
If you, and if you didn't know Aramaic and you're reading the story and just heard, heard that he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then you wouldn't know that there's a word play uh, for the listeners going, ah, he's calling for that prophet. And remember I mentioned last week that Elijah the prophet is a lot like Yoda. He keeps showing up in the New Testament. Well, they, they were there saying, oh, he's Elijah. He wants Elijah. Let's, let's wait and see if Elijah comes before we do anything more with him. Because I didn't have deep understandings and reserves of Scripture as a kid, that is all I read into that. Jesus felt alone and abandoned, and people were making fun of him. And that was enough as a kid. But then one day, I remember reading in Psalms. I decided to read through the Psalms over whatever period of time. And I remember coming across... Psalm 22, and recognizing right away the words at the beginning of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I was touched by that, and then I read the whole thing, and I got touched at a deeper and deeper level, and I didn't even know what was at work. I was too young to know why this psalm was speaking to me at such a deep level. I think now I know it's because I began to see that when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't just saying, why am I so alone? He was evoking an entire world that is represented in Psalm 22. And it's a world so much bigger than you've forsaken me. And so what I wanted to do today, it's a long, it's a long psalm for reading in front of you. I thought about just reading the whole thing, but I've done that kind of thing before. Oh, Lord, it gets painful. <laughs> so we, uh, we made a video this week with a really good scripture reader, and it's just the background that you'll see. I invite you to turn to Psalm 22 because some of you will hear it better if you read along with it. Some of you are, are just designed differently, so you might enjoy watching uh, uh, it's just a flame and some icons behind it. Um, some of you might enjoy staring at the clouds. The, the clouds are perfect for, for this today. Uh, but what I want you to do is listen to Psalm 22. Listen to Psalm 22, not as just some psalm in the past, but as the world and the reality that Jesus was evoking from the cross. And it's so much more than I'm alone. My God. My God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you rescued them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads, saying, Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him save. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. 
My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Save my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and will proclaim his salvation to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. When Christ cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was invoking, he was invoking a psalm that ends with, he has done it. He was speaking out of an entirely different reality than simply death on a cross. He was speaking out of a reality of resurrection and life and joy. That's the world we embrace when we embrace the Word made flesh. If you would like to talk about becoming a part of that reality, if you've never been immersed into the kingdom of God, if you'd like to become a part of Grandview or if you just need prayer for something you're going through, Just meet me or the elders in the back as we stand and sing. Please rise.